maybe from a different perspective. I just hope and pray that, um, that you've, you've had time with him to, to, to talk and to share and to draw closer than, than ever before. I, I hope that's happening for you. Okay, we, uh, boy, we got through some rough stuff last time, no question about that. And, uh, and now it's time for some good stuff, okay? And so I can't wait. I'm so excited about I, some of this stuff I love so much. Uh, it's, uh, well, let's just, let's just jump in and, and see what happens. See where it takes us. Okay, turn to Matthew 27. We'll, uh, we'll see the final stages of uh, the, the time after his death, after Jesus' death. Acts chapter 27. Okay, look at verse 57, I think, yes. As evening, as evening approached, this is after his, right after the crucifixion, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body and Pilate ordered it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, by the way, no one questioned whether he was dead or not. Nobody questioned at that point that he was dead or not. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out from the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Oh, now they're worried about something. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, talking about Jesus, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on it, on the stone, and posting the guard. Now, there were different ways they do that, but let's just suffice it to say they may have used them all because they made it just as secure as they could, and they posted a guard. Okay? Jesus is buried. He definitely died. He's buried. The tomb has been sealed. Okay. By the way, how many guards do you think were there? At the, well, just hang on to that. Well, I'll ask you that question again in a minute. Woo! Now it gets exciting, right? Chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now there's a sight. The stone has been rolled away and there's an angel sitting on that stone. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead. How many guards do you think there were? I mean, I'm just curious. Well, it's more than one. How do I know that? Well, it said the guards. Okay, well, some people said, well, probably two then. One on either side of the... No, no, there wasn't just two. No. One. And see, this is important in a minute. But I'll tell you right now. I don't know exactly how many, but I can tell you this, there were more than some. <laughs> That's kind of a strange way to put it. I get that, but you'll see why I say it like that in a moment. I know there were more than some. Continue. <laughs> verse five. Oh, time out. Time out. Don't leave verse four. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. What, what does that mean? 
Well, somebody, well, they passed out, they fainted. I, I don't think so. Matter of fact, I know they didn't. Well, then what in the world does it mean they shook and became like dead men? Well, I tell you, let me give you a couple of, of thoughts. <coughs> when, when I was a kid, and I was a young kid, I was watching a movie on TV. Now, this is black and white only, probably three channels in those days, uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS. That's, that's all we had, if you could move the rabbit ears around enough to get them. Anyway. I'm watching a movie, and there's this young woman who was the witness to a terrible crime. And so the perpetrators of the crime, they were going to take out this woman. They were going to kill her because she was the witness, all right? So we as the audience, we see what's going on. This, this young woman is in her house, and she needs to go across the street for something. It's nighttime, and she's looking out the window to make sure the coast is clear. Well, right down the street, there's a car parked. No lights on. The lights are off, but you can see the exhaust. Vroom, 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 vroom. Car sitting there, so you know the bad guys are there. But she's looking, she doesn't see that. And so she steps out, you're going, oh no, 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 don't go. She starts across, and as she gets to the street and starts walking across, the car, the headlights come on, and they floor it. And here it comes. And the woman stands there going, and I'm going, okay, okay, move, run. I'm going, run, get out of the street, go back in the house. Oh, oh. And she just stands there, bam, they plowed her. I just turned it off. I said, I ain't watching, that's ridiculous. No way, no how does somebody just stand there and let somebody run over. That's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <clears throat> Shut it off. Well, I was a child. I thought as a child, I, anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. I didn't really understand the concept of being frozen in fear as being a reality until first year of marriage. Beverly and I are in college. We got married after our sophomore year in college. We're living in school apartment and uh, small apartment. And one night, no, we didn't argue fight much, but this one particular night we did. We were fighting about something. I don't know what it was. And... <clears throat> I was mad, she was mad, and I, uh, I stormed into the, the, the bedroom and slammed the door, and she went to the bathroom to dry her hair. She had just washed her hair. So she's running a blow dryer in there, and I'm, la I'm laying on the bed. Now look, we're different, Beverly and I. <clears throat> For me, if, if there's a conflict of some kind, I want to get it out and get it over with. Let's just lay, it on the, lay our cards on the table and be done with it and move on. Beverly, not so much. She's more of a, she wants to sit and let it simmer and may, until it just goes away. Not healthy, but anyway, we found great common ground through the years, but this is our first year. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, we're going to get this cleared up right now. We're going to get this straightened out right here and now. So I get up, I go out of the bedroom and turn to walk the six feet to the bathroom where she's standing at the sink with her back to me head down, blow drying her hair. And I start up, and I, and I have a plan. And I, and I thought it was a good plan, okay, because I was going to go, and I was going to get a hold of her, not, not harshly, but firmly, and turn her around and say, look, we've got to get this, we've got to get this worked out now. And just see what happened from there. But, but what I forgot in the moment, I knew it, but I forgot it in the moment Beverly scares very badly. <clears throat> I learned it early in our dating life. I'd jump out from behind something and boo and scare her. <clears throat> I didn't do that but one time because she just got sick to her stuff. I mean, it, it, she doesn't scare well. I don't do it. Well, I didn't think about it that night. Okay? So my plan was and so I start my plan. I'm walking to her, and I'm still a little mad, you know. And so I'm going to reach out. She's head down, blow drying her hair. And I, as I reach to get a hold of her, she looks up in the mirror and sees this behind her. Scared her out of her mind. She thinks I'm somewhere else. Scared. She drops the blow dryer, and she falls. As she falls, she turns and fortunately, the toilet seat was down. The lid was down. 
And she landed right on it, just sitting on it. And she starts making a funny, funny noise. She's going, oh, oh. And I realized, oh my goodness, I've just scared her to death. And I feel horrible. So I'm going to try to console her. I can't speak. And huh, that's not typical. I can't. I just, when I tried to talk, I just kind of went, I just squeaked. Like, she's going, oh, and I went, Ehh. it was, look, if we had that on video, I know you may be laughing about that. I, I laugh about it. Now. I wasn't laughing then. Scared her so bad, she couldn't speak. That shook me up. I couldn't speak. And so we just sat there, and finally, I just, I got a hold of her, and we, she stood up, and we just embraced, and we cried, and the fight was over. It was It was crazy. But it dawned on me, <laughs> you know what? Someone can be in a state of shock and fear so badly that they can't move or even scream. I thought about that woman in the street, scream or something, she didn't make a sound. I think that's what happened to these guards. By the way, how many guards, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. I think that's what happened to these guards and I'll show you why. Verse five. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Remember those times he said that? Just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. The tomb's empty. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him now. I have told you. Oh, so the women run to tell. There's different accounts will give you different scenes. You need to go read each one as to what happened to them on the way to talk to the disciples. But here's what I want you to see. Watch this. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> While the women were on their way, some of the guards, bing, 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 bing. What would that say? While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. Okay, okay. Some of the guards went to report what happened. If some of them went, that means all of them didn't. If some of them went, some of them stayed. If, if some of them went, how many is that? I don't know. I, I, well, it's not one, I know that. And, and two doesn't seem like enough. Maybe three. The three or more, I think, would qualify for some of them went. But that left some, maybe? I don't know. I don't know how many were there. But it's important. It's going to be important. Hang on to that. There were some, there were more than some guards guarding that tomb. Trained soldiers guarding that tomb. <clears throat> but now watch this. <clears throat> Verse 11 again. While, some, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. You know what that means? They didn't faint. They didn't pass out. At least those didn't. Because it says they went in and reported to the chief priests Everything that happened, they saw it. <laughs> now watch this. Oh man, it just gets better. <clears throat> Verse 12. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, a plan, they devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. <clears throat> Sorry. Wait a minute. Now they're paying the soldiers for something. They devise a plan, then they give them money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. They paid him to say that. It's probably not true. They paid him to say that. Now here's the thing, they get in trouble for that. As a guard over the body like that, if somebody stole that body, their life is on the line. They get executed 
for letting them letting somebody do that. Watch this. You are to say, this is verse 13, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. They're going to cover him. They're not going to get in trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. That's called the theft theory. That theory says that Jesus didn't raise from the dead. His disciples came and stole the body, and, and then they told everybody he was risen. We'll deal with that in a moment. But let me tell you, this plan they come up with, they came up with, look at it again. Verse 12, when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. I want somebody to tell me or tell whoever you're sitting there with, why in the world, why is that not the dumbest plan you've ever heard in your life? I'm telling you, <clears throat> that it, you would think they'd be smarter than that. That's the dumbest thing I've ever, maybe the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now, some will say, was well, that because, you know, the disciples, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to come whoop these guards. And well, yeah, I mean, I believe that's true, but that's not what makes it the dumbest thing. That's pretty dumb. But that's not what makes it the dumbest plan. Come on. Come on. You got to see it. You got to see it. I mean, they've come up with a plan. Verse 13, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. I'd love to have been in the crowd, raised my hand and go, excuse me, excuse me, uh, how do you know? Well, what do you mean? Well, you just said you were asleep. How in the world could you know what happened if you were asleep? <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. They couldn't even come up with a good lie. They could make up anything they want to to try to explain away the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and they come up with that. Whoo! Dumbest thing I've ever heard because if you were sleeping, my friend, you would have no idea what happened and how that body's missing. I'm sorry. I just can't help but laugh. Come on. Dumbest thing you ever heard, right? Oh my goodness. But do you know to this day, that's the most common explanation for the empty tomb. By the way, guys, that tomb was empty then. That tomb's still empty today. Jesus the Christ rose from the dead. All the evidence says he did. Okay, so how is it that some people say that he didn't? Well, there are different theories that people will use to explain away the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And I'm wondering, yeah, I don't need, I won't write it. I was going to write them down, but I changed my mind. Four different theories, because here's, wh here's why they have to have a theory. The tomb was empty. So if you're going to tell me Jesus did not rise from the dead, you're going to have to explain the empty tomb. So uh, how, how about it? Well, that's one of them and the most common, the theft theory. The disciples came and stole his body during the night and then just told everybody he was risen. Well, and I've already told you that their plan, obviously stupid, it's stupid enough, to, as we already mentioned, the, the disciples, several fishermen. I mean, I mean, these guys were not trained soldiers. They're going to come and they're going to take on these armed soldiers, trained, and they're going to whoop them? Come on. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense either. <clears throat> but they would have to do that in order to then crack open the tomb, take his body out, and tell everybody. So the likelihood of that happening is not good. Not good at all. <clears throat> the second theory is called the swoon. S-W-O-O-N, the swoon theory. See, that would help if I could write it down. The, what the swoon theory says is that 
Jesus never really died. I mean, it was an honest mistake. They thought he was dead. He looked dead. So they took him down from the cross thinking he was dead, put him in the tomb, but then the coolness of the tomb and the, the spices and the herbs that were there, you know, he, he, re, he regained consciousness. He came back and, and, and somehow got out and escaped. The tomb's empty. Oh, my goodness, he's risen from the dead. There he is right over there. Look at that. But the truth of the matter is he never actually died. That's the swoon theory. <clears throat> Well, I got, I got some problems with that. <coughs> Sorry. One is, first and foremost, the Roman centurion, the Roman soldiers and the crucifixion practice, they were specialists. They have perfected it. They did it all the time, and they were on a regular basis having to determine when someone's alive and when someone's dead. So they sure thought he was dead, no question about it. In their mind, the ones who were, who were uh, specialists, at that. He's placed in the tomb. Most everybody does not deny Jesus died that day. Most everyone does not deny that he was put in the tomb. The rift comes with the resurrection, right? So the swoon theory says he didn't really die though. They put him in the tomb. And, well, okay, so you put him in the tomb and over a, a, part of, a part of three days, maybe he regains consciousness. But guys, I'm just telling you, if, if the coolness of the tomb and these spices and things resuscitated him and dun, 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 brought him back to health after getting nearly beat to death and then hanging on a cross for six hours, if all of a sudden he's of such great health that he can get out of there, by the way, what about the stone? How does the stone get moved? What, does Jesus find a backward uh, escape from the... No. So the swoon theory, major problems with the swoon theory. Okay, the next theory is the wrong tomb theory. What this, said, what this theory says is, look, there were a lot of tombs in and around the city of Jerusalem, a lot of them open awaiting someone's death, okay, waiting to put somebody in there. Very common. Well, what happened was the women got confused. The women were the ones that came and found the, the tomb was empty. It wasn't that Jesus was risen. They just went to the wrong one. They just went to the wrong tomb. It was open. Jesus wasn't in there. Oh, my word. And they came away talking about he, he's risen from the dead. He's risen from the dead. Okay. This theory, dumbest theory I've ever heard. <laughs> the other was the dumbest plan I've ever heard. This is the dumbest theory I've ever heard, the wrong tomb theory. At first, when you hear it, you think, huh, well, that's kind of, maybe it kind of might make some sense. Maybe they could get confused. You know why this is the dumbest thing ever? <laughs> I'm using that a lot. The dumb, here's why it's the dumbest theory. If that were true, if they went to the wrong tomb and just thought he was risen from the dead, the people that were saying he's not risen from the all they would have to do is go to the right tomb. If he was still dead, just go to the right tomb, crack it open, produce the body, and say, hey, you went to the wrong tomb, you bunch of idiots. Here's the body right here. If that were true. I know this theory is not true. I know this one is not true. This is a modern day idea. I know it's not true. Because all that it would have to have done was go to the right tomb, produce the body. Okay, so wrong tomb theory, out. No way, absolutely impossible. And the fourth, fourth theory is called the hallucination theory. And that is the disciples loved him so much, the women that were there, they loved him so much, they wanted him back so badly that they, they, just, they just believed that they saw him. They just thought they saw him. They just believed they saw him and, said that the, and told everyone that he's risen from the dead. Well, you know what? I'm going to lop that one in with the wrong tomb theory. If that were the case, go crack open the, the tomb where he is, produce the body, and the hallucination theory is proven wrong. So, or, or no, the resurrection is proven wrong if you can produce the body. They couldn't do it. Let me tell you, 
that day and time, there is nobody wanting to produce that body more than the, the Jewish religious leaders. There is nobody wanting to produce that body more than these guys. Oh my goodness. If, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, they'd have found the body. Now then, there are other reasons that I believe the resurrection is true. First off, I believe the Bible. Okay, so I mean, if we believe the Bible, it's easy to accept his resurrection, right? But, but there are other reasons for people who don't necessarily believe Scripture to believe the Bible. And this is the one that I, that I like the most. Listen to this phrase. Nobody dies for a lie if they know it's a lie. Think about it. Plenty of people have died for something that wasn't true. They just thought it was true, right? But nobody, nobody dies for a lie if they know it's a lie. So you think about it. The disciples, if they just pulled a fast one, if they stole his body, told everybody that he was risen from death, they just pulled a fast one on everybody. What do they have to, what do they have to gain for it? If the disciples are lying about Jesus being raised from the dead, what do they have to gain? Persecution? Martyrs? Deaths? For most of them? Their lives were the terrible, terrible things they had to go through because they proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If that was a lie, they would have never gone through what they went through. You know why? Because nobody dies for a lie when they know it's a lie. No, they saw the risen Christ. <clears throat> I love what, uh, <clears throat> what John, Apostle John says at the beginning of his first letter, 1 John 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you, may, that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. The eternal life it lives forever. Well, I just love to hear that right out of the mouth of those who were there, saw Him, touched Him, and by the way, they needed that to believe it. Remember? It wasn't just Thomas. The others needed that too. <laughs> but he, he rises from the dead. The tomb was empty then. It's still empty today. He appears to his, uh, to his disciples and others. Appears to others, a group of over 500 at one point at the same time, for about 40 days <clears throat> before he goes back to where he came from. And uh, it's, I mean, you, you, talk about, you talk about victory. This is incredible. The moment of the resurrection, the impending ascension, and the beginning of the church. Okay, so guys... He, he, he appears to his disciples. He gives them the Great Commission, right? Gives them the Great Commission. Take this gospel to the whole world. Reach the whole world with it. Tell them all about me. I'm the, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he tells them. John 14, he tells them he's going to send the promised Holy Spirit after he has ascended. And so he does ascend. He sends the Holy Spirit and in Acts 2, the church begins. I'm telling you, this guy is absolutely amazing. 
And what I've, what I've wanted to do with this study is obviously not hit all the points, but it's just to try for us to get to know him better, to try to understand him a little more. Uh, it's just, he is so far beyond anything we can imagine. And, and I want us to learn as much about him as we can, but I want us to grow to know him and therefore grow to love him and therefore learn to live for him. And Lord, that's, that's what we want. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, on our behalf. This amazing plan that y'all together formulated before the creation of the world and Father being able to follow through with that from your perspective, to let him do that. And then Jesus, for you to go through with it, after what you suffered along the way, I pray that for each one of us, we produce more joy for you than suffering. You've suffered enough for us already. So I pray that our lives will bring you joy and we long for the day that we see you face to face. I just want to, I, I just, I feel I'd fall at your feet and I feel like you just pick me up and say, come on, brother. And we would embrace. That's just, I long to see you. Thank you for making that possible. And I pray, like I said, I pray that each one of us will, will strive to be more like you each and every day. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And amen. Thank you for being a part of this study. This has been a lot of fun for me. Difficult at times, but victorious, of course, in the end. So love you guys, and go live your life for Jesus.